We have, we have two meetings tonight. Let's call together the uh, legally required public hearing on the 2013-2014 school calendar. Um, Ms. Luton, if you'll note that uh, Mr. Renner is, will be late and Mr. Lee is already Jeff City. And are there any speakers who want to address the 2013-2014 school calendar? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing on the school calendar and open the uh, regular meeting, regular January meeting of the Board of Education, and if you'll please stand for the pledge. <coughs> I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And you want to wait on your education recognition? That was fine. If it's okay with That's the board. That's fine. Sure. So Bruce gets your, Mr. Renner gets your. Um, does, uh, do any board members have uh, modifications to the agenda? Great. Um, my report is fairly short. I attended a meeting at 7.30 this morning when the, uh, the board uh, reviewed and, uh, and uh, unanimously passed a um, proposal to put on the uh, ballot in April a levy, 10 cents. Uh, increase in personal property tax in 2013, 10 cents, 10 cents in 2014 for teachers and kids, as well as approved a $71.65 million bond uh, for classrooms and technology. So it's already been uh, talked about around town and in the news media, and uh, uh, we're glad to have that done. I thank the staff for their work and uh, thank the board for all their questions and work and study. That's all I have. You have a report, Dr. Ritter? Just a brief one. We started the <coughs> second semester right after uh, the first of the year. Uh, really does give a real sharp focus on uh, uh, really a semester as opposed to finishing up a semester and starting over again. So we could just kind of feel the difference. Uh, and so I think it's been a very, very good start. And, um, and so that's really all I want to report because that does kind of connect to the calendar discussion later. So. Uh, two information items this evening. The first one is our second ongoing systems review report. Uh, Dr. Goodman. Good evening. Thank you for having these to us um, last week or even week before, I believe. Uh, this evening with the ongoing systems review <coughs> Um, process piece we want to provide a couple of examples of some response to feedback we received from the um, December session uh, and also I want to start on the front end by apologizing I understand from mr. Hosmer there may have been some problems with the links so I've asked Ms. Luton to drop in the full OSRs if you were not able to access those through the links and those should be available through the ongoing systems review section uh, if you'll recall in December we had six programs come forward um, these programs reflect those that were presented. Uh, and at that time, if you'll recall, we had a plus delta regarding the ongoing systems review process and then also the product itself. And most of the feedback was centered on the product, and so I want to talk about how we've addressed that um, and answer any questions or gather any additional input, and then we will go into this month's as well. Uh, so at that time, the board provided feedback specific to uh, having a need to understand the basis for targets established with the ranges that the programs brought forward. Uh, also needed um, and expressed the need to note opportunities for improvements from previous years that carried with them a financial implication. We'll talk about how we've addressed that. And then uh, finally, there were some very specific um, input received regarding some budgetary details. So in terms of the first one, the need to understand the basis of targets, the board requested uh, wanting and needing to see a rationale. And so what we've come up with is that we've asked program leaders, uh, were asked to provide a commentary for each of the measures on the uh, KSM summary page. And so um, this commentary is then available as a link on the bottom of the KSM summary. So if we take a look at one of those pages, we can see in the bottom right hand corner we have a piece that says link to range commentary. And uh, we believe that as a result of the website um, transformation of hosting that those links may have been broken. So that document is an Excel file also available for you in the OSR section of board docs. And so you can click there 
and you'll go into any specific program and you'll see at the very end of that row there is a commentary box. It's highlighted with a red triangle and if you hover your mouse over that section um, you'll see the commentary kind of rationale basis from the program leader. Additionally, if that word commentary itself is in red, that indicates that a comparable or a benchmark was used in the establishment of the targets. So you can literally go line by line through the measures if there's a question you have about what was the basis for that, and that is in an Excel file. Uh, the second piece was the board communicated need to see previous and current uh, opportunities for improvement with the financial implications. And so the response is that on the OSR summary sheet, it now contains those current and historic opportunities with the financial implications. And the uh, financial implications are an estimated amount in parentheses following those. The way that looks, uh, this is an example from a program this evening. We can see uh, on the left-hand side, we have the key opportunities for improvement, the data sources and then a couple have some red pieces un after them that would carry uh, those opportunities that they, the program leader believes would carry financial implications per the board's input. The third piece, board communicated need to understand budgetary details in a little bit different form than what we initially presented. And so we modified those. Originally we gave number of students served, average <coughs> cost per student, number of schools served, average cost per school. We took away the number of students served and number of schools served since that's standard. We left those two averages, but then we also brought in the total budget of the program and then the percent of the overall budget um, in those lines. And so that comes uh, in this financial consideration section. You can see we've made the adjustments there. And again, this is one from this evening. You can get a sense as to how those look. Uh, are there questions regarding these changes or any other clarification at this time? Questions for Dr. Goodman. Is this what, I, I think this is kind of what we were all asking for. It was helpful, I know, for me. I just want to say thank you for getting to it so quickly. I was yes. impressed that. Thank you for that. You were able to <coughs> yep. get things where we needed them. Okay. Uh, so that then takes us into uh, the ongoing systems review for this month. And I will tell you that uh, as we kind of look at this initial deployment calendar, this month is a little more in line with how we see the months coming four to five programs per month. We were a little heavy out of the gate. Uh, and plus we had some big programs that came through. So we're, we're thinking that this four to five to six is kind of the, the general calendar we'll do. So this evening we have, and this will be the order that the program leaders will join me. Uh, we'll have the purchasing and supply department, the <coughs> attendance and homeless services department, uh, parents as teachers and title one. Uh, so from there we'll begin with purchasing and supply and I'll be joined uh, at the podium by Mr. Dave Pelletier and I will pull up that uh, summary sheet and we'll go from there. <coughs> and so if you recall, we do not uh, have a formal presentation. We'll just open it up for questions at this time. Questions for Mr. Cohn, too. Mr. Hosmer. Just so I understand this, um, the um, financial consideration of the opportunities for improvement. For example, the key opportunity for improvement, additional revenue can be realized in the sale of surplus property <coughs> by assigning a part-time FPE. So the idea is that has not been done, but could be done, and this would be the financial cost of that. Is that? Yes, right now we, we um, basically just have uh, current staff doing it. They're not spending uh, as much time as could be spent on it uh, uh, to realize as much revenue through the sale of those items. Um, it, it's a situation similar to eBay. The more effort you put into describing the product, the more revenue you'll generate, but that also takes more time. Uh, I don't know if everybody's seen how much stuff comes in and out of that supply center, uh, but you have to really stay on top of it. Uh, so yeah, we, we feel if we could have a dedicated person to that, uh, the sale of stuff would more than justify that cost. And we're looking at a part-time person initially, uh, and then evaluate that to see how it actually does work out. Okay. And um, um, when, and, and maybe this is not a question for you, when is this then, <coughs> um, is this going to be presented to the board again in some format, or is this something that will we'll go through the budget process, and will we then get this back that, hey, 
there was all these requests and these were not viewed as rising to the top of what was needed or how yep. is that done? Uh, I'll defer to Dr. Ritter or Mr. Chodas, but yes, these will, these Chodas have a role in the, in the budgetary yes, process. So I'm, okay. guessing, I'm guessing he's saying, is that, yes. okay, all right. And, and, and there, will there be some compilation at budget time to kind of go back through these and say, here's what was, what you saw during the program evaluation. We added some of these in and, and didn't for these reasons. Yes, I believe we provided that information last year at the board request, so we'll continue to do so. Okay, and I, I appreciate that. Judge Ritter. Um, I was just wondering, I'm, I'm reading here that, that you started the online auctions in 2009, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And do you still have the, um, the opportunities where you open up the surplus center and folks can come and purchase on a certain on certain days during the school year district okay. employees can come get surplus at any time yes right. but oh but for sale to the public no sales. we don't have sales on the lot any longer strictly online. Yeah. okay yeah when we had the sales on the lot we were generating about seventeen eighteen thousand dollars revenue a year there were some good deals <laughs> there's not so many good deals anymore <clears throat> well and I noticed that in your key strength number three fifteen thousand annually and that goes up to 107,000 so um, certainly tells you that that's uh, realizing some profit for the district so it's a good idea great thank you both very much uh, next program will be attendance and uh, homeless student services and dr. Quinn will be joining me Questions? <clears throat> Just give us, if you could, give me or the board a snapshot on on what you've seen over the course of this year so far. Not really in re related to your report, but in in terms of homeless services you've had to provide. <clears throat> the main uh, service that we provide is the transportation. We transport students from. Uh, from uh, shelters and hotels, and we've seen an increase of students that we are transporting at this time of the year. We've also seen an increase of homeless students from the same period last year. We're up over 500 students uh, already as of semester uh, this year. Uh, we, we receive three, four, seven calls a day, and uh, sometime it might be the same parents calling day after day they've moved from one place to another in which we work with transportation and they do a great job of rescheduling and reshuffling and, and getting that transportation uh, to the parents. It works, attendance numbers are up, so. There, there's some other services. We're working with uh, Brian Hubbard and Title in which we're providing uh, some tutoring for our homeless students. I think it was about uh, 17 to 20 students are involved in the program so far. And, uh, and Brian's worked with most of this, but trying to find students uh, in areas in which we can reach them, such as Rare Breed and places where we have a number of those students where we can, we can get those services to them. Frederick. Do you still receive, <coughs> you still receive uh, an amount of Title I monies that's designated specifically for homeless students. Yes, and, um, and Brian deals with, with that part of it. I just wondered if that's up or down. I doubt it's going to be any more. You mean as far as the money or the, the funding? Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Twitty. Just as a snapshot, when you're looking at this key opportunities, we see that <coughs> there's suggested additional monies for um, the mileage for attendance advisors and um, the training. So when I look at this, is it forty five hundred dollars? Well, the mileage is for the attendance advisors, right. and uh, over the last several years, and even when uh, Becky Morgan was over the department, uh, she would have to receive more money for mileage. Usually, anywhere from twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars for the mileage for the attendance advisors to travel over the district for the year. Uh, and that ties in with the uh, interventions that are in here somewhere. The interventions, we have about four, 13, 14 inter interventions that we track. 
and it could be from transporting students uh, to school, back home, uh, sometimes with uh, parents and students will need assistance with getting to the doctor during the school day, uh, making home visits, <coughs> making uh, address checks, so the schools will send the attendance advisors out on those particular I, I'm not questioning at all the, the need for the additional <coughs> cost, but I'm just saying as you look at this, it looks like if you were standing in front of us talking about your program today, you know, $4,500 is an increase. The, the, yes, the last part is from the, for attending training. And uh, to go to a national convention somewhere, the last one was in Albuquerque with. But again, I'm still saying this yeah. is, this is so small. Uh, it's what I'm, it's what I'm taking from it. And you know, as the board gets closer to budget time, this is kind of unusual. Well, it depends on how many people you want to send. Okay. I, I, I kind of budgeted on the low side. Okay. All right. Thank you. Some of the things that's happening, though, is that there's a lot of services. Be t uh, we're lo losing a lot of services in the community because of uh, state and federal cuts, and those are coming into us. So I think that's a very appropriate point that you're bringing. It's probably a little bit higher as far as the need is concerned, but that's what we got to be careful of. We don't do all everything for the community. But still, that's the challenge. Yes, Ms. Cal. I know that students and families, <coughs> excuse me, only qualify to receive certain services if they can prove they're home, homeless. But homeless has a pretty broad definition, and I think it would be helpful for me to be reminded what that is, and maybe our community too, because I think sometimes people hear well, we're providing transportation for this student, but we're not for this, you know, and they really do have to meet a certain criteria, right? Correct. Uh, I mean, the definition is very broad, and usually uh, when we talk with, uh, talk with others, they, they think of the kind of the original definition of homeless, uh, just not having any place to stay <coughs> and living on the street and those kind of things. But uh, there are other types of homelessness. We have people that lose their houses for financial reasons or their house burned down. Those people are considered homeless until they can find a permanent residence. So, uh, you know, we have families that lose their jobs or there are cases where there's uh, abuse or violence in the home and families move to violent centers. And, and uh, so those families are considered homeless also. Do we determine that based on like a rubric that people have to go through to, I mean, is that self-determined by the district or, and then do we have to prove to the federal government? It is determined by the district, but we work with the shelters and, uh, and they have advisors there and they get in contact with us. And uh, if, a, if they're at the violence center, you know, they call us and say, we have a family here and they're here because of violence. And so that will determine them and make them homeless. So we have to get them transportation starting at that point from that that place because at one time and I doubt that this has changed there was a definition where even if you were living in what was considered like substandard housing or um, cohabitation of more than one family you know together is that still yes. considered if it's not a fixed regular residence where you would normally live like a temporary type of situation well you know I just think <coughs> for so many children that are caught in this situation, school and education and that structure that and the safety and just the um, consistency, the care that is so important. So I think this is one of the most important um, areas that we deal with in terms of really supporting children in need and families in need. But Got it. What's the issues here? Uh, just a comment, I guess, on the uh, on the uh, OSR. Uh, <coughs> I guess what I would like to see more it, with the key strengths, and it has data sources in there. Uh, uh, I think there needs to be more of a focus on uh, what the evidence is for the key strengths, as opposed to just the statement itself. Um, the attendance department staff is knowledgeable, dedicated, and committed. I mean, I guess I see that, but but in terms of a key strength, I think I would want it to be, you know, attendances 
improved X amount or, or uh, been involved with, you know, more uh, organizations or, um, so going forward, I think I'd like to see more in terms of uh, objective um, um, and data-based uh, uh, numbers in the, in the strengths and opportunities for improvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you both very much. Dr. Flynn. Uh, next will be um, Missy Riley with Parents as Teachers. <clears throat> Questions for Missy? Comments? <laughs> well, there's uncertainty in funding, isn't there? What the state's going to do. Um, Um, refresh my memory as to how you deal with uh, children and family and families with with children who obviously need intervention and other families who seem to be on autopilot and you don't require as many visits I don't remember the break point there and how you, how you um, that's changed maybe even since I did my last program report but um, we now have two categories of families and um, those two are high needs and by high needs we mean families that um, fall into at least two of our high needs categories and there are about 24 high needs categories um, as defined by DASI for parents as teachers and the non high needs and um, currently um, since our the major cuts that we had a few years ago and um, because we're also kind of an, in a transition period with National Center and DASI um, most of our families who um, fall into that non-high needs category are only receiving um, one to two visits and our um, high needs families are receiving anywhere from four to 24. And so it varies just depending upon the family and how available the family makes themselves and um, then also the specific needs of the family. It's probably pretty obvious to, the, uh, to your staff as to who needs more and who doesn't. Know. Yeah, it, it is um, more or less, you know, and then we have to have the parents that are responsive back, also um, those that want to have that high intensity of visits too. But um, one of our uh, sticky situations that we're kind of in now is that with that focus on the high needs, we don't want the program to appear that it's a high needs program because then families won't self-identify as high needs. And then without getting in with that parent educator at least that one initial time for a screening and an initial visit, then it's really hard to identify who is high needs and who's not. Uh, and this is probably a question for Matt, but um, it says average cost per student $52.63. Is that per child that participates or is that per student in the Springfield Public in the district? I believe it's for per student in the district. Okay. Here's an example where it would be really helpful. I mean, for me to know how much it costs us per student in the district with a program that is very focused towards children that aren't, quote, in the district would be helpful because it, it's, it'd be helpful for me to see how much does it cost us to serve these families that we're serving with this particular service. You see what I mean? And it might help to do a breakdown verse of those families that are only receiving one visit versus the families that are high intensity families too. Right. So yeah. there are lots of different ways to look at because, that. Because I mean, this is a very labor intensive program and I think it's, um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a one on one program. <coughs> and I think it's, I think it's a good program, but I think um, it would be helpful to see how much it costs us to provide that one-on-one -on -one care or teaching or, um, in, I mean, a variety of different things that we provide. So, um, you know, as, as we look at these programs, I think we're gonna have to figure out, okay, who are they serving and what's the cost of who we're serving? Um, because I would really, at, at one point, I thought it was like $75 a visit or something. Is that about right still? Um, probably a little higher, maybe. That's probably close. I haven't looked at that since my last yeah. program report. So, so maybe it can be an average cost per student served. 
for this like for this kind of program, I think that's much more helpful. I mean, as we look at funding parents and teachers, and if we decide, you know, as a district, we want to fund more parent educators than the state gives us, you know, where's the trade-off there? That's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Uh, question maybe, uh, and maybe a comment. This is, and we're gonna see a number of these programs where we, we got the program because of financial problems and then we get a report about how the program's doing and and I expect to see the program not doing so well if we're going to gut it because of financial considerations so and I don't know again if this is a question or, or or where I'm going with this but but I think it somehow it needs to be as a board we need to be aware of the the fact that we're cutting really needed programs and not just you know um, kind of stumbling along with with much with much fewer resources is that does that make sense uh, in, in with these reports that that you know we're already talking about the request would be to decrease the number of visits to non high need students to one screening per year <coughs> I, I'm assuming that's not what we really think is great for for kids participating in parents and teachers uh, I'm assuming everybody on this board understands that this is a good program and and has lots of value, but, but yet this report talks about our next step being to decrease visits. And I understand why we're doing that because we're trying to do this with a much smaller budget, but um, I, I just would hope that, that would be kept in mind with these reports, especially with programs where we cut, we chopped a lot of money out, not because we think the program is not doing what we wanted to do, but because we got we got to cut something somewhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm not sure to take the feedback and respond with action. And is this a product question or kind of a process? Because I mean, I think there is kind of like this history piece that, that you're <coughs> reflecting. You know, that's helpful to see the the trend, but then it it almost seems like it kind of leads to. I guess maybe how these OSRs will be used in the budgeting process this year is, I guess, kind of where it mm -hmm. sounds like we're setting up towards. Yep. I'd say save your question until uh, about April. And well, uh, I th yeah, I think what's starting to happen, though, as we get this information and go through this process, we're thinking ahead and going, okay, this is how we're going to okay. use it. And it really does, I mean, we probably look like we don't really know what we want up here. <laughs> but I think what it is is it's solidifying the kind of information that's going to be helpful. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is, um, Missy, you mentioned something about the National Center. Is there something going on with that organization as well? Or? Yes, um, they, we're, they're changing to a new set of um, program affiliation guidelines. <coughs> And um, within those program affiliation guidelines, um, there are 18 of those, and that's reflected in my report somewhere else, not on um, the summary, but there are 18 of those guidelines. Without any effort, we were already meeting 12 of those. Um, we have another five of those 18 that um, we put in our yellow zone, so things that we think we'll be able to meet without a lot of effort. And then we have one that's our red zone. And that also kind of leads back to um, my budget request, my quasi budget request there. But um, part, the one standard that we feel we're going to have difficulty meeting or is that our biggest challenge is that they recommend that um, all families, even those non high needs families, those families that have zero or one um, high needs indicators that are in the parents as teachers program, are to receive um, uh, 12 visits on an annual basis. And um, high needs yeah. families are to receive 24. And so if we were um, to do that, um, we would need way more than what I requested, which seems like a big number. Um, that would get us to about, I think, a third of the families that we're serving if I had that number. Um, so we're looking at lots of different ways that we can meet that standard. And one of them that we've talked about is trying to um, to work out the highest needs birth to three families, um, birth to age three, because we do have other programs that kind of take over at age three. And so we're looking in all different manners, but that's our one big sticking point I'm right now. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Is it, is it, I mean, what, what do you, 
what does meeting those standards, I mean, could we restructure, could we restructure what we do here locally um, and do it maybe more effectively and more efficiently and not, I, I guess what I'm saying is what does it buy us to, to meet the standards or could we create even a better program for our community to meet the needs that we know right. we need to meet. Great question. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is piece <laughs> together. Um, the sticking point there is that we receive um, reimbursement from DESE. And to this point, DESE has supported whatever National Center has said that we need to do. So our funding, our reimbursement piece, which is about half of our budget typically, um, is in line with what National Center says that we but need to do. if we could go to the state like we've done with some other things that we yes. do district-wide and say, we feel like we could meet the objectives of this program and maybe meet them beyond you know this certain level and do it without jumping through all these hoops which it kind of seems like that i mean i'm not saying that they're right not and good I, standards but i that's definitely the conversation we've been okay, having good. and so that's right in line with our thinking also that there are some very good components um, there's the option to be a curriculum user too at this point um, and we don't know if DESI will support reimbursement for being only curriculum users. So we're really in a state of influx, not really knowing where to go and what to so do. that might be something we would talk to um, state board about yes. or um, SC officials. Yes. Thank you all very much. Do, do I got one, one more question about, or comment about this, I guess. You know, I don't think that we've funded parents and teachers as as fully as we should have and I think we understand I understand why we haven't done it but 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 and yet I look at the the KSM summary on this I mean you're asking potentially asking for six hundred seventy thousand dollars more is that the number uh, 15 parent educators mm -hmm. uh, and yet on the KSM you know I see two red marks that, that tell us that we've got issues and and I guess from these reports with programs that we've severely underfunded I'm surprised that we have all this green uh, and funding performance w well <clears throat> the idea behind this I thought was to alert us to what changes that need to be made and part of that, I'm assuming, is funding. That if you if you pull funding out of a program, you know we're going to our constituents and saying we need more money to fund this system. And you've got a KSM summary that looks basically mostly green from parents to teachers, even though we've cut money from parents to teachers and they need more money. Um, to me, that's a bit of a disconnect. That. Uh, I would expect programs that we've not, I think, fully funded in the past, um, I wouldn't expect to have all this green, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I understand that. I think there's really three critical issues here that we as a nation struggle <coughs> with. Size of classroom for kindergartners, early childhood, parents as teachers. In all cases, we're starving. You know, and, and so uh, to me, should be a lot of that kind of stuff with, with red, but anyway. It's pretty amazing point. what you're doing with yeah. the resources you have. Oh, that's what Mr. Hosmer suggested last time, or when was that? I can't remember when. <coughs> Got to be careful we don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, and final program uh, will be Title One and Mr. Brian Hubbard. On your key opportunities, key opportunities for <coughs> improvement with the <coughs> side drop in the math series, but then you also mentioned that in your next steps that this will be an important discussion with principals when you meet for allocation of Title I dollars discussion. Now, am I understand last year when we received the cut, um, the, the $1 million cut, that that came from building allocation dollars. And um, so a building may have experienced 
as much as an FTE decrease. So they may be kind of guessing here, had to give up a math specialist. Is that correct? Correct. If, if you remember in 2010-11, we had the ERA uh, funds or ARA funds. Um, and then we had the next year fell from, I think, uh, around $12 million <coughs> to $9 million. And that was a big cut there. And then this last year, as you know, we had uh, another cut on top of that to the state uh, that was around 15% across, uh, across the state. So um, we've reduced our staffing uh, really overall, but especially in math, I think from 2010-11, we went from around 16 specialists to uh, six the next year and then six again this year. Um, and that's uh, across the board for reading specialists as well. Well, it didn't impact reading as much cause pr because principals kept the, uh, the reading specialists in general over the math specialists. So then that leads me to ask, um, then whatever we see this year in terms of our funding, do you anticipate that there will be an increase in the allocations to the individual buildings so they can replace a math special if they choose? Because I know that right. money, the sequestered <coughs> money was released we put it back into title, we put it back into one year's classrooms. Well, we, we had basically 50-50 split, uh, half went to the sites, however. They couldn't hire. <laughs> it was mid-year, so it's kind of hard to come up with uh, specialized staff at that, at that point. So I would uh, imagine our numbers should come up, although you know how <laughs> we should never assume mm -hmm. as far as uh, federal dollars, but it, it, next year it does look like with the No Child Left Behind waivers, we won't have some of those issues that were just up in the air every year, like the uh, the transfers uh, and tutoring, um, those things will be you know established by us as far as le that flexibility of spending at the site. So we should hopefully in the spring have our numbers and be able to meet with principals and make decisions about staffing uh, based on data and uh, the the funding that we will receive in the spring. And I noticed in number three there was a dip in uh, perception of impact of the coaching. Was there also a decrease in the number of literacy coaches in the buildings that might account for that? Um, I, I think that you know we have the, kind of the big picture with the with all of the title staff in the buildings, and whenever that goes down, I think you come into difficult situations where everything's spread thinner at the sites and the Title One sites, uh, and and we really think that a lot of that had to do with less uh, reading recovery re or reading interventionists in the classroom, less mass support, less paraprofessional help, and then uh, the, the coaches are spread very thin. So we think uh, that that might have had the impact on those numbers on the, on the teacher perception. Um, but we're thinking that if we do that uh, mid-year, we're actually planning to give that survey again mid-year. And then at the end, uh, we want to make sure if we have lower numbers as far as teacher uh, perception uh, or satisfaction with the program that we can act on it and put that information back in the hands of the coaches. Do we still have the same number of literacy coaches? Uh, well, we have a smaller number of uh, title uh, schools this year, and so the number went down with that. But it basically, every every building has at least uh, the, the literacy coach. Um, but then I think we have five uh, we have five math coaches this year. So the when we had five math coaches last year, so we have 20, 25 coaches <coughs> in the building. Do we have the flexibility of determining, um, like I, I know since I've been on the board, we've had Title I schools. So we weren't really, and, and those hap, you know, those were schools that had a certain percentage of free or induced, uh, uh, students eligible for free and induced lunch that attend that. But any student who attended that school, whether they received free and reduced lunch, if they needed remediation, qualified because the school qualified, right? Right, well, we used to have targeted, um, and then um, probably about five years ago, I think it was maybe the year that I that I came on, um, uh, we switched to school-wide. So we have some students that we, we still target with our interventionists, um, but then we also can spend funds on any school, uh, any student in the, uh, in the school, or we can also spend funds for any of the teachers. Used to be that only the teachers that actually had students served by title interventionists could partake in uh, the PD or supplies and materials. So if a child or a group of children uh, who would qualify for Title I services based on their eligibility for free and reduced lunch, but attend a school 
whose threshold isn't there, what kind of uh, interventions are available for them if if their socioeconomic status, uh, you know, their socioeconomic condition, you know, has made that, um, you know, is, a, is an obstacle for their learning? Well, unfortunately, whenever they're uh, in K-12, there, there is no uh, Title I funding for, for like, district-wide funding. We do have district-wide uh, wonder years or preschool programs, so uh, that makes sense, and we switch to that four years ago because it didn't make sense that, you know, because they moved to a different area that we have to kick them out of the program. So unfortunately, they're, we have to fund it by school. We rank the schools first by free and reduced lunch, and then we look at the funding um, uh, as we rank them, and that is based on free and reduced lunch. I wonder if there might be some, op and this is just wondering to get myself in trouble, but I wonder if there would be some opportunity to start to use our distance learning, um, you know, um, outreach and have a literacy coach that, you know, we use that forum to reach children that, you know, might not be in a Title I school, but I don't know, it's just an idea. I've just often thought that we're missing <coughs> maybe supporting that group of students just because of where right. they live in the district. I agree. I think uh, it's difficult, <coughs> but there definitely are quite a few <laughs> guidelines, and, yeah. and there's uh, the supplant supplantment issue um, where, uh, you know, if the district normally covers, we, we're basically a supplemental program. So, um, but I think that's a, a great idea to As we to start to think about using about. technology and as we ask our community to expand our bandwidth to do those kinds of things, I, I, I really think we need to be as creative as, as, creative as we can um, and as children get used to learning that way and I don't know. I th we have done some partnering with non-title schools as far as resources like after schools. Sometimes uh, the coaches collaborate or have gone over for some <coughs> trainings and um, sometimes when we have professional development we'll invite other schools in uh, in addition to if we're already if we're already doing it and we have space available. Other than the um, I know one of the strengths was how close the title schools were with the district average in reading, I guess, was one of the strengths. Other than <coughs> than measuring that, uh, have we? What other measurements do we have available that tease out what the value add is for the title dollars in a school? Um, well, last year, <coughs> well, actually, from uh, the last um, program evaluation, one of the things that uh, we identified as uh, an opportunity for improvement was actually tracking our students and being able to get the data to help drive the program. Um, and since then, we, uh, we've worked with Matt's office to make sure that the specialists are able to put in demographic data, start date, end date, what services, um, basically any type of information we'd need to, uh, to retrieve the data to, to track the program. And so any uh, assessments that our specialists are doing um, with the students they input, uh, also we track uh, a few assessments, or, or actually the, uh, the DRA that they give at the Title I schools as well. So um, we, we start off with uh, dial scores as far as uh, Wonder Years goes, and then we move into our observation screening, uh, the DRA assessments. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I just thought we might want to start doing is looking at the performance, uh, performance data and actually pulling out our students and disaggregating for the Title I students that are targeted uh, rather than all the students in the school to, uh, to see how they're performing versus the quartile one students um, that we aren't serving. So we just have a lot more uh, opportunity for historical reports, but it really starts last year because before that we didn't have um, the, uh, the information to be able to really drill down into that. We really didn't even have which students served, we served and separated from, uh, from the others besides on paper. And I asked Mr. Hubbard to start there because that's kind of, that would kind of be the, the ground floor, the baseline place to start is that tracking of the, it's kind of like the treatment idea. Who was treated, for how long were they treated, to be able to then go to those next type of, of questions. 
And so as we worked on collecting that data last year, we're now in a position where we can begin to, to start to tease some of that out. Um, but we are, this, this does reflect the first full year of collection, is that right? Right. So last year was kind of a work in process, so. And, and would you agree that, I mean, that performance series is gonna be some of the best data if we have a title school with beginning year, middle year, end of year, and we have a non-title school beginning year, middle year, end of the year, that, that comparing those, those that the growth between those yep. would tease out some of that value, right? And then the, the opportunity uh, to look at the quartiles as well. Um, that's a, another added piece there that we can really compare apples to apples. That, since I have a memory issue, is this gonna, would this come back to us? When would that come back to us? When could we see a, a chunk of that? Well, that's an interesting question because uh, the OSRs are kind of goal driven. And so, your question in my mind is is more of a kind of a pure research um, um, inquiry, so to speak. It would seem to me that if we would look at that type of data, if we would examine it in that way, there'd be a finding that would come out of it. And so it would be that finding that would drive a goal um, coming off of it, right? So if we looked and we saw that the growth wasn't as dramatic, we s studied it and here's where we identified it. Um, from how do we fit that into into the OSR? My mind is we kind of set up like a process goal that says we're gonna set up a process to do this type of examination. Where are we at in that process? Report that, if we get it complete, then we bring the goal in. But I'd also, wouldn't, wouldn't one of the I don't wanna micromanage the program either. So. Wouldn't one of the goals of Title I to be a value add to the district? That, that, that having a Title I money in a school would <coughs> improve instruction versus not having Title I money in a school? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I would defer that question to the Dr. Ritter or the full cabinet. Yeah, I would agree, but I even think one step beyond that, and that would be strength of literacy, performance, performance and literacy. In other words, how literate is the child based on the impact of Title I? But, so. And I, I guess the question goes to a comment which was made in the demographic study, which talked about right. one of the needs he identified was that the district needs to seriously look at why we have 95% free and reduced schools and 12% free and reduced schools and, and whether or not, you know, the title is the best way to approach that poverty issue or whether or not some type of a, of a, of a trying to pull some of those uh, free and reduced percentages down would be a better uh, way to, to impact those numbers. And so that's why teasing out what we're actually getting for all these title dollars, uh, I think would become sure. important. That's what this is about. Dr. Ritter. One last question. Do we currently have the capability and the inform component of our performance series to pull out or disaggregate Title I students? Um, we do have kind of a flag in there. However, the <coughs> data that Mr. Hubbard referenced that the interventionists themselves are tracking is separate from that. It's kind of lives in its own system and that's because it's been a system that's in development from even a process. We've, we've had to establish the processes of how to collect, get the system built, test it, does it work? So presently, no, those two are sitting separately to be able to just click the button to see that. Um, and it's also, Brian referenced working with our department, it's also the information technology department's actually been instrumental and have done the heavy lifting in that build. Um, so I, I wouldn't be able to sp speak to say, yeah, it's six months away to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, theoretically, I could see how those two could potentially come together. You know, it's, it's, it's been interesting, it's been a learning experience for us on the board as now we've gone through the second round of these. Um, it's also been a learning experience for staff, I'm sure. Uh, and I don't Daily. fully expect to have any of the bugs worked out for a while yet, but, but you know, the improvements, improvements, so. Cabinet discussions really have just made, uh, really chip, shifted our focus a little bit. And uh, they've taken our name and. <laughs> uh, we've, we haven't said that. <coughs> okay. Hey, I've talked. And I would, I guess, connect that comment to a comment Ms. Cowan made earlier about um, the responsiveness of, of making some of these changes. We will take your feedback and make the shifts we can. Um, however, we only have one more program in the next round left, and so I'll have to process through. So we may not always be able to 
be as timely as we were this month. And with that, I segue into the plus delta for both the report and the document itself, as well as the process we've used, because uh, we do we do want to be formal in, in meeting your needs. Comments, critiques, plus deltas, Victor Scalar. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about the cost <coughs> per part per participant. Also, I think the Title One is another example of where it would be helpful to see. You know, cost per student, uh, that's not really the cost <coughs> for what it costs us to provide those services to, to that particular child. So I think, I think looking at who that program serves and trying to figure out the best way to present that information would be helpful to me. On that idea of like student participation or participation. Make your denominator more specific. The same thing as for yeah, Then we just have to, the trick just <coughs> playing it ahead is will be the operational definition of who is a participant. I mean, that's for us to figure out. Well, we can I'm have, I mean, the, the cost per student is probably okay because that just kind of shows, you know, the full pie of what it costs, you know, us. But I think there are some of these that really require to see a cost per participant. I mean, the same thing I said about the athletics. And um, activities last month. That's going to help us this spring. All right, let's move on to uh, Mr. Chodas. Yes, yes, please. We're going back to uh, some board recognition. I don't know if everybody noticed, but the Boy Scout left. <coughs> he was struggling. Before I begin, I want to recognize Mark Fisher. I thought he, he would maybe come in, but anyway, I think Mark, yeah. he's not here. <laughs> he, he is not here, but he's done an awesome job. I mean, what, what an outstanding uh, uh, work he's done is, uh, with the Healthy Fields uh, Initiative as well as the, uh, uh, the Tournament of Champions. I mean, what, a, what an outstanding situation, uh, performance he's done. In light of that as well, I think the Board of Education has done an awesome job and, and needs to be recognized. And I have a proclamation here from the governor, as well as the Secretary of State, and, uh, and signed, by the way, a certificate signed uh, by the MSBA, by the president of M MSBA, and that's Jerry <laughs> Lee. That will be so a anyway, item, so. Maybe that's why he's not here, I don't know. But anyway, from the Office of the Governor of the State of Missouri, the proclamation is, whereas a system of quality public education is essential to the future of our state and nation, and whereas the people of Missouri have a long tradition of support for public education and their local school districts, and whereas local school boards are the ultimate expression of the unique American institution of representative governance of public school districts, and whereas local school boards acting on behalf of and in close connection with the people of their communities chart the direction of education in their, in their communities and whereas local school boards serve as the key community advocate for children, youths, and the public schools. Now therefore, I, Jeremiah W. J. Nixon, Governor of the State of Missouri, do hereby proclaim January 20th through the 26th, 2013 to be School Board Recognition Week in Missouri, and in Missouri and urge all Missourians to recognize school boards as they strive with their communities to improve our public, public schools through quality leadership. In testimony whereof, I have his sign below, I'll have to read all that. Okay. And it's by the governor as well as the secretary of state. So Jerry Lee, of course, and then we have Dr. Denise Frederick, Dr. Tom Prater, Chris Kellen, Gene Twitty, Bruce Renner, and Andy Hosmer. So I want to thank all of you and congratulate you. And, and really, if anybody's giving of their time and talents without any kind of remuneration, that's you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ritter. Now we're ready for Mr. Wendt. And do I s get the feel from reading this report that you're just weeks away from completing air conditioning? <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping. 
Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, Dr. Ritter. It's my pleasure to present the uh, quarterly update for the 2009 uh, bond program. And this evening, one of the things that I'd like to point out first is one of the changes that we've made to the report, and that's in regards to uh, change orders. Um, you will notice on the report that in the summary section, we've actually added a line to show what the percentage of the change order is. In the past, we've just indicated the dollar amounts there. Um, and uh, after uh, visiting with our internal auditor, Mr. Mueller had suggested that it would be a good idea to actually show the percentage. And so you will notice that in the report as one of the changes. Uh, our goal is to try to stay below 5%. Uh, in our change orders and basically what we're looking at is uh, basically like an industry standard or a national average if you will um, it's really tough to pin that down uh, the best I'm able to determine is that's between a five and ten percent uh, range and it, you'll see as I go through uh, our summary tonight I'll, I'll hit on the change order percentages with the projects first as we look at our air conditioning projects um, Boyd was completed at 3.12% change orders. Jarrett completed at 2.15%. Uh, Phelps is still in the testing and balancing and commissioning phases. So in essence, the project's complete, but we continue to tweak and monitor till we get our final reports before we close out the project. That's at a 3.69%. Uh, Reed completed at 2.83%. Robertson at 324 Roundtree is still uh, having some commissioning completed there at 3.54%. Uh, Sunshine has testing, balancing, and commissioning going on. They're at 1.53%. And uh, let me remind the board, this was one of the projects that we rebid that had come in so high, and we reduced it by half a million dollars with the rebid. Uh, Teft is currently in progress. We don't have any change orders on that project at this point. And York was completed with 0.79% on change orders. So we are extremely pleased with uh, our change order percentages on those projects. I do have to show you a piece of duct work and uh, <laughs> some uh, air conditioning equipment. This is at Teft uh, as we go forward. As we look at our other projects, uh, the first projects we're looking at here were the Glendale. We had the bleachers, Glendale electrical upgrades, and Glendale. It should have been Glendale and Kickapoo Stadium lighting, and you see, can see the percentages of change orders we had for those projects. Um, and I'll get into more specifics on the three construction projects, but just so you can see, Hillcrest at the 1.74% change order in progress, Jeffrey, Jeffries at 2.3%. Um, and I'll just say that part of that 2.3 also represents, in the scope of the Jeffries project, we were going to tie the addition sewer line into the main sewer line that feeds then from the site out to the street. Uh, when they went to do the tie-in, they found out that there were, um, the old sewer line was decaying and, and uh, we were having all <laughs> kinds of issues with it. So. Uh, we did a change order, it's funded from major repair, and that represented just over 19,000. So if you back that out of this, that would drop the Jeffries uh, change order percentage to 1.6%. And Westport at this point is at a 1.27% change orders uh, in progress. So I'm really pleased with how that's coming along. Now as we look more specifically at the three main construction projects with Hillcrest still on target for completion in March, uh, this is on the uh, uh, the hyper where the enclosure for the elevator uh, is going in. Uh, the equipment is uh, to be uh, to start working on that uh, this week. Uh, also in the hyper, there were new uh, lockers put in the boys' locker room section as part of that project. Uh, this switches actually to the main building. Uh, it's a lot of brick. That's actually along the side of the uh, um, auditorium. We had some major stress cracks. We were doing some tuck pointing as part of the project there. We actually had to remove that whole section of uh, masonry and, and redo that. You can see where that is in relationship to the, the rest of the auditorium and the, and the new main entrance. Uh, this is one of the uh, renovated classrooms. This was actually in the old kitchen area. Uh, and this is across the hall in the old cafeteria area where uh, several of the classrooms that were uh, converted. 
This is in the uh, auditorium as part of that renovation. Uh, in the bottom uh, picture, you can see where we had removed the old uh, ceiling tiles. Uh, and you can see in the main photo how that's all been redone. The floor, we've done the uh, stained polished concrete in the main areas where the seating is going, going to be installed. And then uh, the aisles in the front and the back will actually receive carpet. So it's coming together very nicely. Uh, this is from uh, outside of that FEMA structure area and just another look and you can see with the sod in place it's really uh, come together very nice. I'd also like to point out inside that FEMA structure this is done with uh, polished stained concrete. Uh, one of the things that we asked of the contractor in this particular facility was to actually grind that concrete down to where we would expose the aggregate and so you can see that there and it gives that uh, what we refer to as poor man's terrazzo <laughs> look to the project and it is very, it's beautiful. It hides the dirt. And I wouldn't want to miss out on the, uh, the domestic hot water lines and the tunnel work that was all part of the project that no one ever gets a chance to see. Mm -hmm. um, then we go to Jeffries. Uh, Jeffries is uh, and has been uh, behind schedule. We anticipate at this point we're looking at a mid-February. Uh, we have uh, receive partial occupancy of the building. We have moved into the new office areas across the, the front there to the left of that new entrance. Uh, you can see the new uh, parking on the east side of the building and there's still more uh, concrete to be poured as the uh, they're trying to hit the good weather temperature days uh, to get the rest of the concrete poured on the project. This is actually inside the uh, FEMA structure. You can see the new wood floor put in the gym, the platform in the uh, background there. Uh, and then on the up, upper left, you can see where they've actually uh, painted. So it's all coming together very nicely. Uh, the upper left photo here is actually that connection into the addition. And the uh, lower right photo is the corridor going into that new office area there. So it's all coming together very nicely and as I said, we hope to be completed by uh, mid-February. As we look at Westport, Westport is on track for uh, our May completion, running right on target. And you can see from uh, standing where the new drive would be coming up to that new uh, uh, circle entrance into Westport with that relocation of uh, the entrance facing the park. A uh, closer look at it here. Uh, to the left of that entrance, that would be the new administration area. You can see the uh, gymnasium up behind there is the actual FEMA portion of the building. This is inside the uh, new administrative area. This would be as if you were standing in the reception area and looking through. You have to start visualizing walls going up. Uh, this is actually on top of the roof of what was the old library and, the, and now the, uh, the elementary gymnasium. Uh, looking down over to the, to the left is the kitchen area and then the serving and the commons area where you can see the windows uh, that are going to go in to bring light into that new commons area. This is along the uh, I'm sorry, north side of the uh, building, which is the new middle school wing. Uh, you can see the science uh, rooms actually project out uh, a little bit farther there. They have the stone columns. Uh, here, this is on the other side of that middle school wing, and one of the things I'd like to point out here, you can see where actually the, uh, the new construction ties, uh, the new architecture ties into the old building, and the architects did a beautiful job there. This is inside one of the new classrooms, and uh, again, we're doing a lot of the polished stained concrete. And here you can see it, I'm sorry, the lighting isn't the greatest in the slide, but you can see the uh, stained pattern on the floor that's actually polished in. And this is actually looking down that wing of the new middle uh, school classrooms. Uh, to the right side where you see the white paint, that actually is where the lockers uh, fill in along there. And again, back to the entry area of the building. As we look at the technology portion, uh, Mr. Green and his staff have done an outstanding job and have completed 100% of both the Phase 1 and Phase 2 training and all the installation. <coughs> of course, we do love to show our students using the, different, uh, the technology at the different sites with the smart boards. And with that, I'll uh, answer any questions that you might have or attempt to.
questions for Mr. Lynch. I got to use the smart board when I lectured at Glendale. It's the first time I'd used one. It's pretty, pretty slick technology. Um, a couple things I want to just briefly comment on. Um, you know, we're just getting ready to ask the voters to approve another bond issue. And I think that when we look at the low percentage of change orders, uh, uh, that's very comforting, should be very comforting to all of us who pay taxes. And, and then when we look at the overall scope of the project, and after the big adjustment in, in Westport's duty, um, we're looking at a, a maybe a, a shortage of less than a million dollars. Um, yeah, so and that's a projected yeah. estimate at, the, at this amount, but we're they're looking to be right around a million dollars. We'll, we'll hold you to that. <laughs> Other questions, comments, Mrs. Calvin? <clears throat> in terms of change orders, it's not always a bad thing. I mean, like what you said, you know, when we get into the scope of the project and we decide we can do something and do it uh, more inexpensively while we're in the project than, than not. But would it be fair to say that this will allow you, and, and I'm thankful for Mr. Mueller's um, in, input on this because I think this is exactly what we wanted him to do, but would it help then your department track that so you could see you know, what architects or what um, people, you know, what companies we've worked with over the years that we've had favorable response, you know, favorable change order response to and those that we haven't? I mean, is we, that? We actually were internally tracking. We okay. just weren't reflecting it on that report. Uh, but, but we have monitored those change order. We, you know, we look at those dollar amounts and we run those calculations all the time. But uh, to your point, there's three main reasons for change orders. One could be uh, design issues or errors. Uh, another one could be code-related issues that come up. And then the third is owner ads. So they do fall into those three different categories. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the calendar, Dr. Harrell, uh, items for separate consideration. Let's see, we're voting on these tonight, aren't we? <coughs> Dr. Harrell. Good evening. I came to you at the study session, uh, actually brought you three calendars uh, this evening. I would ask for your review and approval of the 2013-2014 calendar as it was presented uh, at the study session. Any questions for Dr. Harrell? I would uh, gotta get down to the motion. The board of, I'd take a motion the Board of Education approve the calendar year for 2013-2014 as it had. Dr. Frederick? Second. Mrs. Callan? Dr. Harrell, you're up again. If you remember back in the spring, April, May, uh, brought to you information about an innovation grant that was being developed from the governor's office and was part of a partnership agreement with OTC, uh, Missouri State University, and a request for us to be involved in that from the K-12 arena. Uh, that grant had with it some pretty strong stipulations on the employer piece, which is Mercy and Cox Health Systems. Uh, and it kind of put things into a little bit of a, of a slowdown or a stop over the summer and into the early fall. Those <coughs> restrictions due to changes in the grant expectations uh, have been lifted and reduced. MSU and OTC, as well as uh, Mercy and Cox Health Systems have reconnected and, and have reinstated the approach towards the grant. With the involvement of this grant, it would, for the first year, which would be 13-14, we would be committing an FTE, one teacher FTE, and we'd be committing uh, tuition for those 20 students. Tuition then would go for 40 students beginning in the 14-15 school year and maintain at 40 for the remainder of the life of the grant or until 126 students were served, which is the target of the grant. 
This grant is designed to focus on uh, students with exceptional performance, 3.5 GPA or higher, strong attendance and good citizenship, as well as have an interest in the medical field. It is designed to be a collaboration between the K-12 arena, uh, OTC and MSU, and also the employers, uh, Mercy and Cox Health, in an attempt to generate Where's it getting in? Employment for students in the medical field. So it's kind of a fast track. Uh, it would be housed in the middle college program at OTC at this point. So we have the framework through the middle college program that we would be utilizing for this. The difference between this and the current middle college program is that it does uh, focus on students who are performing very well and who also come from low to medium uh, economic status. So this evening I would be asking for approval for the FTE uh, with the understanding in 1314 that the tuition cost would also begin for those 20 students. And I ask for the approval for the FTE uh, at this point because we would want to hire the teachers so they could start working on uh, planning and those kinds of pieces in the remainder of the spring. Straight. Um, in looking over these numbers and the partnerships and what, how the agreements have changed with the Cox and what we're to provide, you know, I guess to not put it delica delicately, where's, what skin in the game does OTC have in this? OTC offers obviously the training component of it. We use their facilities and so there's that cost that is a, it's a, not necessarily a hard cost, but it's a cost for the facilities and the issues or in the um, uh, materials they have there on staff. And then the tuition for the collegiate level courses would be taken off through the grant itself. So the grant pays for the collegiate level tuition. We pay for the high school courses tuition. So it's a similar set to what we have for middle college at this point. So is the cost the same per student as middle college? Our, our tuition cost to OTC are the same for middle college for students who just go over there for high school level courses that are outside of the middle college. We have about 260, 270 students annually that attend OTC. And yes, they are the same. Okay, so the, the cost to us is no different than the cost for middle college? The cost to us would be no different than the cost of middle college on the tuition. That is correct. So we're basically expanding our middle college options to include nursing. Yes. Or health health services. Health allied health field. Do we feel like we have the interest? I mean, have have students have students that participate in middle college said we wish we had the allied health option. I think that there would be interest in this particular because. This is a little bit of a different approach. You know, middle college was focused around students who um, had a great deal of capability, but at that point maybe struggled being successful, whereas these students um, are, are going to already be proven that they're being very successful in high school. So it is a similar approach, uh, but it's a different end of the continuum as far as the student. But we would only be committed, to, I mean, we'd be committed to the FTE no matter how many students were interested, right? And then what if we don't get, is it 20? 20, yes. What if we don't get 20 students interested? What is our commitment? Do we only pay for The commitment one? of the grant is for the 126 students. We have the, it, it, our 20 students have to be the, the choice as part of the agreement. If we got in a situation where we only had five students, then I think we'd have to renegotiate and discuss with OTC about how they would approach. But they would have to fill the positions and they would look outside of the district. And so I think that'd be a question on, that'd be another set of questions that Ms. Cal and I couldn't answer for you. Um, we haven't really, we're not at that point. I, do I believe we can get 20 students interested in the, in the project annually? I believe that we can. But as far as if we have very low numbers, I, I don't have an exact response to you that we'd have to revisit our approach with the FTE. These are these are jobs that are uh, these are there's a definite need for graduates in these careers. Uh, 
from us and from OTC and Middle College and all that. I know the hospitals are desperate for these type of employees. Do, what is their contribution? Uh, do they have a financial contribution or a, a uh, verbal support contribution? The contribution, as I understand it, from the, the partnership organization would be the commitment for internships okay. and on the grounds training. Okay. Uh, obviously, there's a financial component of that. The exact numbers I wouldn't have, Dr. Prater. Okay. And then a preferred hiring approach once these students completed. The design behind around, around these grants is uh, economic stimulus of local areas. So the hope's keeping those that brain power as well as the financial piece in the community for these students. We'll take a recommendation of the Board of Education. Uh, uh, the, uh, so we talked about um, OTC's input here. We talked about Cox and, and Mercy's input. Missouri State, what's their input other than these kids would go to MSU to finish their degree? Well, the students would have to, once they finished at OTC, they would have to um, apply and meet the expectations of these fields that currently stand. So there would be no waiver automatic. They would still have to meet those criteria. Assuming they do, MSU has offered a thousand dollar scholarship for completion of it for each one of those students. A thousand dollars per year, or a thousand dollars for the two, or it, be, I guess it'd be one remaining year. Would that it be? is my assumption that that's repeatable, but I don't know that for a fact, Mr. Trousman. But the thousand dollars. The idea that they would do this their junior and senior years with a joint Springfield Public Schools OTC class, and then the third year at Missouri State. Their third and fourth year, yes. I thought, thought Typically, they're four-year degree plans. Okay. Uh, and so they would, they'd give a $1,000 grant if the kid got into Missouri State? That's my understanding, and I believe that's a repeatable scholarship, but again, I don't know that for a fact. And do we have an idea of whether that would be enough to get low-income kids to think that that's a viable career alternative? I, mean, I think that would be a family-by-family family conversation, Mr. Rosmer. I don't, I don't know that I have an answer to that. And the reason I say, I mean, I'm certainly generally supportive of these types of programs, and I think it's a wonderful fit, as Dr. Prater said. I mean, there's certainly a need in the future for, for these jobs. We've got kids that want these <coughs> jobs, and we can help them get to the point where they get these jobs. I, I guess I wonder if all we're going to get is a two years at OTC, which kids can already get for free under the A-plus program. Uh, and so, again, I'm generally supportive. I, 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 to me, I don't know that, that I see that, that, that there's going to be a four-year success, and I don't see that. I guess I'm a little disappointed that Cox and, and Mercy are not more, and maybe they just haven't been asked, but more financially and otherwise supportive of this because they're the ones that are really going to benefit down the road when they've got high quality nurses filling their hospitals. Um, so, well, I think it's fair to yeah. say that a bit of this is out of our hands, isn't it? Because this was kind of foisted on us by the governor and part of an economic development plan, and some of the details aren't clearly worked out. and out of our control a bit. It is the idea behind this is to accelerate that <coughs> completion cycle and again to build the economic basis by getting those jobs open and those people into the job market uh, at an earlier, at an earlier pace. Okay. Dr. Prater. Um, I've kind of been <coughs> tracking this grant because it's been of interest to me and I did attend the governor's press release and you were there and Dr. Rear, you were there and this was what, in the summer? I believe that's correct. Uh, yes. In which the first grant that was brought forward to us was announced publicly that this is, you know, what was going to happen, the partnerships. I was disappointed that Springfield Public Schools, while we're financing a uh, <coughs> significant part of this, uh, we really were not mentioned much. It was just kind of offhand. We're <coughs> going to do an FTE, and that was all that was mentioned. So, you know, if we go forward with this, because it is a great thing for, you know, 20, 40 of our students. Um, but I think it 
for our community to know that we are pretty much going to carry the uh, fiscal, you know, the financial part of this. And I think this should read SPS, <laughs> ODC, yes. and MSU uh, grant at the least because we are um, an MSU providing the <coughs> $1,000 scholarship, which we know may buy books. Yeah. Um, and what we're going to provide for our students um, and then versus OTC's waiving the medical courses, but I think they're going to be reimbursed from the grant for that. So we will be carrying mm -hmm. the financial load of this. Yep. That's accurate. That's right. Exactly accurate. Ms. Catlin. No, I was just going <coughs> to say, I just yeah. want to clarify once again that we're being asked to participate in this, and yet there's no state funding to the public school entity to um, support what, you know, like I agree with Mr. Hasmer. I'm generally very supportive of, I mean, this is another choice option. It's expanding middle college. Um, you know, all those things that I think we know have been good for our system. So I'm generally supportive, but it's really irritating to me. <laughs> and thank you, Denise, for saying it so articulately, that we're nowhere mentioned in this grant. And we, we need, to, need to change that. So we'll give you a mandate, Dr. Ritter, to put that out there. Uh, we may be obligated, the governor, to help us in other ways. Yep. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> now I would take a motion. The board heartily approve the addition of one teacher and tuition for those students involved in the 2013-14 school year. I'll make that motion. Mrs. Callan. Second. Mr. Renner. Mr. Chodas, we're ready for the treasurer's report. Thank you. I'd ask members of the board to open the financial statement uh, for December 2012. Um, revenue is coming in slightly ahead of the same pace last year. Um, expenditures are coming in uh, slightly below the pace last year, which is good. Um, sales tax uh, continues to uh, uh, reflect strong numbers and hopefully that's indicative of uh, what's going on in the economy. Um, in fact, I have the uh, information for January on the sales tax since we received that earlier in the month and, and uh, for the month of January we're up uh, $127,000 over last year's uh, sales tax and that's all good. Um, <coughs> basic formula, one thing I, I look at each month is the uh, proration factor. Um, I mentioned that to the board uh, last month. Um, in November, the proration factor was 92%. Um, in December, it jumped up to 92.6%. And in January, it's now up to 92.7%. And that 0.1 increase uh, uh, generates about $50,000 uh, additional funding to the district. Um, everything's looking good. Any questions? Yeah. We just spent it. Yeah, we spent that money just now. It's in our bank, right? Yeah. I take a recommendation the board approve the treasurer's report as presented. Second. Mrs. Twitty. Second. Uh, Mrs. Callan, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Steve. Everybody voted. We have several routine action items that are listed on board docs in section nine. We may approve those uh, in one motion uh, as submitted. So moved. Mr. Mm -hmm. Renner. Second. By Mrs. Twitty. <coughs> the board approved the routine action items as submitted. <coughs> And then we have general consent items that you'll see listed in section 10. 
that we may also approve um, as submitted. So moved. Mrs. Callan. Second. Mr. Renner. see the information items listed, which are the, basically the school calendars for the next three years. Uh, public comments, I don't believe we have any uh, public comments. We can move on to uh, board comments and legislative updates. We're, uh, several of us are attending a uh, Springfield area uh, salute to our legislators in Jefferson City tomorrow. tomorrow? Yeah, we're going up tomorrow uh, to meet and greet and twist arms and shake hands, so we'll do that. I don't know who else is going. W one of us is I going. It's you and no, I Jer Jerry, Jerry will Jerry's be up. Jerry's up there already, and Dr. Ritter will be up there, and as, as well as a bus full of Springfield uh, delegates. We'll have some staff there too. Right. <clears throat> Good. Uh, anything else from the legislative front? A couple things that are happening that kind of spook me a little bit. One is that we have a, a, a group in St. Louis really coming from an, on a national level trying to. Uh, legislate the whole idea of grading schools and that is basically uh, grading schools uh, districts and grading schools and of, this of course is an initiative that Florida did and they they're claiming that because they graded the schools they saw improvement and uh, and uh, so I'm concerned about that because we had the same thing in Colorado and that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen because what it does is basically yeah that's the best way I can describe it <laughs> anyway basically what it does is it's a very intimidating <coughs> Uh, it's very violent uh, as far as uh, approach because really it does get to the child and uh, so I think it's really the wrong way to the do it. What's the name of that group? Uh, I don't have it with me. It came up a couple of days ago, but I can forward that to you. But uh, I know MASA, MASA, MSBA, everybody's aware of it. And um, <clears throat> I've had a couple of our local legislators uh, approach me and ask me about that. So. Um, there's also uh, a couple other uh, initiatives uh, by a person that we all know and that's still trying to privatize and we're gonna continue to have that issue. But uh, other than that, uh, it's still kind of, everybody's kind of mulling around and uh, trying to get their, their feet on the ground as far as legislation is concerned. Um, so that's all I have Good. at this time. Do board members have future issues? Or other issues. I have I have an announcement to make that um, we just found this out before the meeting tonight, right, Juanita? Yes, uh, Midwest Dairy Council just notified us that we have been awarded twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars for our breakfast in the classroom program. Great. And so we just got it. So <laughs> it doesn't have a stipulation that it has to be milk, does it? <laughs> uh, okay, milk or cheese, whatever. But anyway, I wanted to announce that. Um, uh, we need to vote to go into executive session to discuss audit findings, personnel, and real estate matters as provided in section 610.021.23, 13, and 17. Take a motion to that effect. Mrs. Twitty. And uh, Gregory. Chair. I think we're adjourned to executive. Uh, Giving the money as much as if we get a little bit of credit, it'd be nice. Yeah. <coughs>